Hi, good evening. This is Rahul Reddy from Reddy Newman PC. We are live here from Houston, Texas. Every week we do bring in immigration, business immigration news from Houston, Texas. Along with me is my business partner, Emily. Thanks for joining us today. Again, I have to say good luck to the Astros. Game six of the World Series is tonight, so hopefully they will take it all and bring back that trophy. Um, again. Again, and also happy Halloween a little bit early since we'll, the next time we'll see you will be after Halloween. Hopefully your kids will have fun trick-or-treating. Um, okay, so this week we wanted to talk to you about driver's license renewals. Um, there's a special process that a lot of the uh, state agencies use to verify immigration uh, status when you, especially when you have something pending and you are relying on that pending extension, for example. And so we wanted to give you a little bit of an overview of that save verification process. Uh, we are also seeing continued high levels of H-1B denials uh, that are happening uh, much more than ever before. We're seeing... Emily, do you mean only H-1Bs? Really all types of high-skilled uh, work visas are seeing a much higher uh, standard being applied and higher rates of denials. And um, you know, at the same time, we have more denials, but more of these denials are being overturned when companies are filing an appeal. Um, so there seems to be some pushback from the Administrative Appeals Office on that. And then lastly, we did re uh, receive an update regarding the USCIS Ombudsman's position that um, individual is resigning, which seems to be the name of the game for any of Trump's appointees and in, in his cabinet. Um, so we have another one bites the dust, I guess. <laughs> so, um, you want to talk about driver's licenses yeah, first? Yeah, Emily, you know, a lot of people, they file their non-immigrant visas, and it becomes very tough for them when their non-immigrant visa is pending for a long period of time. For example, in H-4s, they're taking about seven, eight months to get those H-4s approved. Uh, what is their status on the driving license? Can they get the driving license? Yeah, so even though, you know, once you have an extension application pending for most types of work visas or their dependents, you're in a period of authorized stay and you're legally allowed to remain in the country. But many states were denying driver's licenses until you actually received the approval notice that has the new I-94 on it. Now, um, now we know that many of the states use the SAVE verification system. That's kind of a way that state agencies, all different types of agencies, but driver's license offices in particular, can coordinate with the immigration service to verify someone's immigration status, um, rather than relying on the documents that you bring to the driver's license renewal. Um, so typically what happens in that situation where your extension is pending and you're showing up with your receipt notice, um, they have to, the driver's license office has to request USCIS for confirmation that this person is in valid status. This is done through a save system um, that verifies. And so typically the driver's license office takes care of everything. So there's not really anything you can do, but they will submit that request and then you wait, usually you'll get a letter in the mail letting you know everything's gone through and you can come back to the driver's license office to get your um, license renewed. Uh, but now you actually can check the status of that save process, the verification process. There's a website you can go to um, called Save Case Check and that allows you to enter in some of your information, usually your I-94 number and your birth date. Um, sometimes the driver's license office will actually give you a save case number, so you can enter that number, but it will pop up with a list of verifications that have been done, and it tells you what the status is. So if it says that the uh, information has been sent back to the agency and it'll actually give a date, uh, then that allows you to go back to the agency without having to wait for that letter to come in the mail. So it kind of speeds up the process a little bit and gives you a little bit more inside information on what's happening in the background while you're waiting. And the link has been provided in the, in the Facebook and YouTube. 
you can go to the bottom and, and check the link guys for the save case check status where you can go and check it. It will be very useful, especially when you're applying for the driving license. Emily, Trump, we have seen the high level of denials in the Trump administration. So what about your office? Are you getting any denials or are you 100% approvals? We were definitely getting denials. I don't think it's any higher than it was last year. Uh, probably a little bit lower than last year, I'd say. I feel like, you know, with all of the filings we do every different month, it's a moving target. So we're constantly taking the feedback that we get on a case over here a month ago and making changes. So you mean to say that on the denial that you got last month, you're improving on? Right, exactly. Because, I mean, we don't know That's... what what the target is. That's the most frustrating part is we make updates, we submit more documents, and now they come up with something new that they're requesting. And this is happening on H1s. It's also happening on L1s. I've never seen so many RFEs on L1s. L1A, L1B, it doesn't matter how special the person is, no matter what level of documents you submit, practically you're going to get a request for evidence. This, this question commonly comes, Emily, when people are planning their lives, they want to do something in there, they want to get the things done properly. Is there any foolproof method that you have where if I provide you all the documents in the way you wanted it, can you get me the approval? Unfortunately, no. Um, you know, obviously, it, everything is very subjective and it's up to the particular officer. It's the officer you need to satisfy that you are meeting the requirements. So yes, you can. there are some things you can do. You can make sure that you have documentation showing each of the criteria for whatever visa type you're requesting are met. Um, but from one month to the next, what documents you need to meet those right criteria are changing. Um, so in one case, we're submitting X, Y, and Z documents, and the, the next case, now we submit X, Y, Z, and A, B, and C, and now we get another request for evidence saying you need one, two, and three. It's, um, so there really is no way to guarantee not getting a request for evidence. There are a couple of common tips that we would give it to you for you guys. I mean, uh, is that what we are noticing is that in general, compared to the consulting companies, where the employee is working at from a third party location to compare to where the person is working at the employer location, we definitely see more approvals coming from the place where the employer is working at the employer location. That's the number one tip that I can do. The other main thing is that if you get the decision before your I-94 expires, you may have a lot of different options to explore. Um, if your I-94 expires, your options will be very limited. So for example, if your L-1B is expiring uh, in a particular time and you get the denial, you have an option of filing one more L-1B extension, you have an option of filing a change of status to other, some other application, you have an option of uh, moving to another employee if you have an option of H-1B by any chance if you have used up. So all those options can be explored if the I-94 validity is there. So these two things, uh, we definitely want you guys to be well aware where you can make uh, the change if you can, probably. I mean, uh, if you are ending up with a consulting company and you are having two, three layers as compared to only one layer, obviously the advantage will be that if you have a direct end client and you're working for the company and there's no vendors in between, you have an advantage there. Uh, having more layers has more chances of denial. These are the couple of tips that we can give. But as Emily has pointed out, in this administration, there is nothing that is foolproof that we can say. Uh, the denials uh, in the previous administration we used to see a monthly with our volume of business, we used to get two denials. It was a big nightmare for us. We used to have a whole staff meeting. The employer, the employee, and sometimes the employee family used to be on the conference call with us discussing why, and we used to send the RFEs and the denials. You know, everybody has their interpretations how to present the documentation. Uh, we're not telling that, you know, we are the best and we don't get any denials. Yes, it happens with our office too, just like any other offices. And we used to get denials very rarely, but now the denials have gone up more than 10 times than that what we used to see in 2015 and 2016. Now, this is across the board, not, with our, uh, not just with our office. So there are certain tips that we have pointed, I pointed out before. I would like you guys to take care of those things. There are also some, you know, tips like, for example, 
if you are an H1B, your spouse is also an H1B, and your I-94 is coming to end, you may want to throw a H-4 application there and keep it there. Just in case if your H-1B gets denied, you can rely on the H-4 application. So there are certain steps that you can take. Uh, those things that are on your hand that I advise you to take those things. Emily, in case, uh, you know, you tell that now the USCIS, we are seeing a lot of cases that were denied by the administration is also getting overturned in the administrative office, uh, administrative appeals unit. Uh, can you explain what the process is? Is that the best process or do you have any other process too? Right. So in the past, uh, we typically saw when you received a denial of a visa petition and you have a couple of options. You can file a motion to reopen or a motion to reconsider that's handled by the service center or you can file an appeal that goes to a different administrative office that is still part of Homeland Security, but it's, a, it's still a separate office. So you're getting kind of another look at it. Um, previously, the percentage of H-1B cases, for example, that actually got overturned if you filed that appeal to the separate office, was only about 3%. Um, not all of the denials that are being received are appealed, but those that were being appealed, only about 3% of the, those decisions were overturned and they ultimately received approvals or the petition was sent back to the service center for further processing. Now that number has skyrocketed to 15%. Now I say skyrocketed, but that is a pretty big Good. difference. Yeah. Um, it, it, Five times. Yeah, it seems that the although the um, officers that are making the decisions uh, we're seeing more and more denials. The AAO, the Administrative Appeals Office, is saying, hey, you're going a little too far with these denials. You're not following the law or you didn't properly review the facts of the case. Um, so that is somewhat a good sign that means that some of these denials are not proper denials. Now, the other thing to realize, though, is the appeal is not your only option, and more and more employers are seeking um, help from the federal courts to get their cases overturned rather than only going to the administrative appeals office. So I think that number that is being overturned is actually quite a bit higher if we were able to calculate the number of cases that federal courts overturn. We don't have that data, but I do think it's a lot higher than that. Emily, so when we go to the appeals, administrative appeals unit, and it's taking about one and a half, two years sometimes, Sometimes they do consider the same thing in motion to reconsider and then give an adjudication uh, in about six to eight months. Uh, but when you go to the litigation process, how does that process, how long does it take? And you know, obviously the percentage of chances are more higher when we go to the court system. Can you also explain in terms of financial wise, how much does it cost if you go through a law firm like ours or similar law firms like that, if you go through an appeal process as compared to the litigation process. Mm -hmm. You don't have to give the exact but percentage of money, how much more when you go through the appeal process as compared to the litigation process. Yeah, and the, one of the major benefits of going through the litigation with the federal courts versus the administrative appeals office is the timeline. So with filing a, an appeal, First, it, the case is going to be looked at by the service center. That can take up to 45 to 60 days. And then it, it's transferred to the administrative appeals office. Once they receive it, normal processing time is six months. So you're looking at at least eight months for an appeal to be processed. It can go beyond that. They don't have a set case processing where it's outside normal processing time. There's no way to call them and ask them to expedite it or anything like that. It's just up to whatever the administrative appeals office wants to do. Compare that to litigation. When you file a lawsuit, you are basically arguing that the USCIS, when they denied that case, it was based on um, an arbitrary or capricious reason. It was not in accordance with what the law says or what the regulations say. Once you file the lawsuit, the government then has 60 days to respond in court to your complaint. And they might respond in court to the, to the complaint by saying, no, we were right, this is a good decision. That is a possibility. But most of the time, rather than doing that, they actually will take a look at the case during those 60 days, and if they don't think it's something they can win in court, they just reopen it and approve it 
um, without ever actually having the court telling them to do that. So you could potentially get your case overturned in 60 days through litigation versus eight months or more through the appeals process. And s still less percentage of chances with the admi administrative unit. Exactly. And the cost-wise, the litigation is more expensive, but it's not completely out of range. I mean, when you're filing an appeal, you've got the $700 filing fee. Plus, I mean, legal fees can be very high for writing that appeal brief because you're limited. You have only 30 days to respond to file that appeal. And by the time you actually got the denial in the mail, you've probably already lost 10 days. So you really only have maybe 20 days to actually write a brief and file it with the administrative appeals office. So that causes that expedited processing does often cause higher legal fees for filing that appeal. Compare that to litigation. The deadline, there's no 30-day deadline. You have more time to be able to file with the court. The cost is higher, but you're likely to get a response much faster than going the administrative appeals route. And uh, Emily, on the, a lot of people have this question. When they go to the uh, appeal process, uh, we know that they are going to the administration, though. When they're going to the litigation, they're going to the court process. That means that you're suing the USCIS. Uh, is there any repercussions for the employer and employee because you're suing the government? The great thing is no, there are not. I mean, there, it, the, the government is not allowed to retaliate against you simply because you sued them to get what they should have done the first time around. Uh, we don't see any kind of retaliation happening either for the employees. Uh, we file a lot of uh, litigation for H-4 EAD holders in delay cases. Not seen any kind of retaliation there. For employers, uh, when you're filing a lawsuit for a particular denial, you're limited, the court and the uh, government's attorney is limited to whatever information is already in the record that you filed only in that case. They're only looking at that case to make a decision. Um, so, you know, a lot of times companies are worried that there's going to be this big discovery process and they're going to have to provide, open up their records and provide all of this information. It's going to be a big hassle. That's not the case. You're limited to what's already there before the agency and whatever arguments you make in your litigation. And we don't see any kind of retaliation. We really see it from the employer side the opposite effect. Next time around, when that company files a petition for someone else or a petition for an extension, uh, um, USCIS might recognize that company and say, whoa, we think we, this is kind of a litigation risk. We don't want to take any chances here. So you might actually see some better decisions than what you normally would have in the future. I mean, now we have this ombudsman. Um, uh, you know, this ombudsman, normally ombudsman is not a part of the government. They're not a cabinet member, but they're actually paid by the government, but they are supposed to act on behalf of the people, uh, especially the immigrant beneficiaries. Now, we have seen the current ombudsman who resigned comes from an organization which is actually anti-immigrants. They actually want to get away the immigration out, and she has been in charge of, of these. It's like making, uh, for a herd of sheep, you keep a wolf to take care of them. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's how this ombudsman was. And now she resigned. What is expected of this administration with the next ombudsman? Yeah, I mean, we might think, oh, it's a good thing she's resigning. Maybe we'll get someone better, but... Uh, that didn't happen in this administration. <laughs> yeah, I doubt it. I, I think that we're going to see more of the same, more hardliners on immigration, more... Um, you know, we don't have any idea who this next person would be, but I, just given the Trump administration, I, I, I'd be quite it's sure. It's not going it's, to be a wolf, it's going to be a tiger. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> definitely not going to get better. Hopefully it won't get worse, but very possible that it will be worse. Uh, so we, we definitely want you guys to keep the option for litigation with this administration. We don't think so that any most of the activities this administration is doing in immigration is legal. It's not that we think that when they're going to the courts. The courts are not thinking that this administration is doing anything good uh, at all. I mean, when they try to take away the employment authorization for the DACA kids, we know what happened in the court. They just court blocked everything out, and they're still getting the employment authorization. So most of the things what this administration is doing, particularly in immigration, uh, I don't think so. It's legal. If you just compare, you know, Law has not changed in, since the time this administration came in. There's only some slight changes with regards to how 
the lottery system should be countered, which actually they did a good job on, on how the H-1B lottery should be. But other than that, nothing has changed, yet we do see a lot of denials. So this is something that we are worried, uh, with the, this is something that we want you guys to be alert and try to sue the government if necessary, uh, because that's the only way for this government is willing to listen. Um, let's go to questions, Emily, unless you have anything. That sounds good. Um, question that I have is, how many pages of the passport needs to be there uh, uh, for getting the stamping um, for the U.S. Uh, uh, US consulate to stamp? That's a question that comes in. For the Indian passport, I would recommend at least three or four, four pages. If any chance you're running out of the pages, you can always approach the consulate. They give an extra booklet attached with the passport, so you can use that booklet for the stamping. That's an easy way. Don't try to take a risk with the consulate because if they don't have uh, the stamping enough pages there, they might tell you to get it done and that's going to delay the entire thing. Uh, Vikram from YouTube wants to know if it's wise to change jobs right now in this situation while you're on H-1B since there are all of these denials. Um, it can be. Uh, uh, the, there are ways to do it in a wise manner to where your status won't be affected. And the main thing you can do is, number one, have the transfer filed in premium processing, and number two, wait until it's approved before you actually quit your current job and move to that new employer. Because if you file a transfer and you're still with your old employer and that transfer gets denied, there is zero impact on your status. You just continue on with the existing employer. Um, so that would be the safe way to do a transfer if you're considering that. Can an employee with an approved I-140 B1C change the job after six months um, from the date of the approval? EB1C, I wouldn't uh, advise changing the job after the six months though. Now, if you have filed the adjustment of status and you're pending with the adjustment of status, after 180 days, you can consider changing the job. But if you're just EB1C is approved and you're contemplating changing the job, I would not do that. The number one reason is that when you go join some company B, um, they cannot get mostly 99% of the time because that new company won't be eligible to get the EB1C approval. So you cannot be able to port from EB1C to another EB1C unless the, the company that you're leaving and the company you're joining are related companies that you worked previously in your home country. So most probably that's not going to happen. Uh, so you're going to move into EB2. So the waiting list for EB2 or EB3 is very long. I would not recommend that you change unless you already filed the adjustment of status. Uh, Rupak from YouTube wants to know what options there are for a 221G. So a 221G is uh, referring to a visa refusal at a consulate, but that's a temporary refusal that you can overcome if the consular officer goes through this what they call administrative processing, meaning that they They've temporarily denied your visa, but once they go through this administrative processing and check everything, they may still approve it. So it's just a temporary denial. Now, what are they checking into? It could be any number of things. It could be some sort of security check, um, some, uh, you know, maybe your name and birth date match someone in their database that has some criminal issue and they need to verify that it's not you. Um, 221G can be when there's a security advisory opinion needed. That's common if you have an education background that's in the kind of a sensitive field. Um, and there's, you know, there's kind of a list out there, but it's an old list. We don't know exactly what's on it, but sometimes you'll be asked to submit your resume and experience background in more detail so that they can verify um, what the purpose is that you're coming into the U.S. and to make sure it's not to um, use this sensitive technology against us. So that's another type of situation where you might see a 221G. It's also very common in the situation of third-party placement where you're working at an end client site and you show up to the consulate, you give your interview, and they ask to see your end client letter. They look at the end client letter. Now they need to take that end client letter back to the end client verify who wrote it and ask them to verify that it's the same letter that they actually wrote. They do all of that during the administrative processing through 
the Kentucky Consular Center's Fraud Prevention Unit. So all of those things are possible during a 221G. What can you do about it? Nothing. There is nothing you can do to speed up the 221G, nothing you can do to get through the administrative processing. There's no expedite. All you can do is wait, keep checking on your case every 30 days. Um, once it goes through, then if everything turns out to be fine, the visa will be issued. Um, but unfortunately, there's just nothing you can do. Radha Krishna has this question. His wife is on H4 EAD. She has, a, she has graduated as a phys uh, physiotherapy, a physiotherapist. Uh, can she apply any job or is she limited to only physiotherapy job? Uh, she can apply for any job. On the H4 EAD, there's no restriction, none whatsoever at all. So on a H4 EAD, they can work anything. I mean, nothing wrong with it. Um, there are restrictions with regards to on H1B, a lot of conditions need to be met. But on H4 EAD, absolutely no condition. Um, she can do any job which, uh, if she can get the job, she, she, may be, she will be able to do it. Uh, in general, physiotherapy is in a high demand. You know, my wife is a physical therapist, so you may want to consider her to move, get the licensing uh, in the physiotherapy, but as such, legal requirement, uh, no. No legal requirement as what jobs she can do. Any areas, she can do it. Uh, Shubham from Facebook is planning to travel to India and has an existing visa stamp from an old company, but has a, an approved petition with the new company and wants to know if that's going to be an issue at the port of entry. So um, assuming that your visa stamp is in the same visa category, such as an H-1B, and you had that stamp with your old employer, but it hasn't expired, and now you've transferred to a new employer and have a new petition approval notice with a new I-94, you can still use the old visa stamp as long as it hasn't expired to enter and show the officer at the port of entry your new approval notice and be granted admission through the period of the new approval notice. So absolutely no problem with that, but you have to be careful to check the date, the end date that they give you at the airport before you walk away. We find many times that when um, even if you provide them that new approval notice, sometimes they mistakenly put the date that's on your visa when your visa stamp is expiring. And that's an error, and you should be able to get it fixed right then and there. If you don't realize it then, and you go and you know print out your I-94 later, realize you got the shortened date, now you either have to file an extension, travel again to fix it, or try to go to deferred inspection to get it fixed. Jay Krishna has this question from YouTube. If he has a 797A approval, can he go to a different consulate than the consulate mentioned on the I-797A approval? Absolutely. You can go to any consulate which allows you to go in. For example, if you have a consulate approval as, uh, as Chennai and you want to go to Hyderabad or Bombay, that's perfectly fine. Uh, but you have to make sure that why you got the 797A. If you are in United States, you got a 797A because you didn't maintain the status you are only restricted to go to your home consulate. Home consulate doesn't mean that it has to be the same consulate where you belong to, but in the home country consulate. So if the 797A is given because you didn't maintain the status, I would strongly advise to go to the consulate in which country that you belong to, not to any other consulate. But in general, there is no restriction, uh, but we need to look into why, if there is a uh, change of status denied or extension of status denied, then you have to go to the home country, any, any consulate in the home country. Um, Nitya Priya from YouTube wishes us a happy Diwali. Happy Diwali to you too and everyone else out there. Um, and wants to know if there's any update on the PERM site being down since September 2019. Are you aware of any issues with the PERM website? Um, Wasn't there some change in the PERM website? Uh, we did change the prevailing wage to the flag system and the LCA changed over to the flag system, but the PERM... Mega, anything? Mega, you know anything in the PERM system? No. We don't see any changes in the PERM system. Uh, it should be active. I don't know why you're looking at that way. All right, let's see. Go ahead, sorry. Um, the question that comes from Joel from the YouTube is that, is it advisable to change to different company because my company is filing a green card after 24 months after I start my work? Um, it's really more personal. Uh, depends on, I mean, 
are they going to stick with 24 months? 24 months is a long period of time. Things can go up and down. I also would like to consider, Joel, uh, how long do you have a H-1B left? If you have only three years left and your company is going to start your um, green card application 24 months from now, I would leave the company immediately. Um, Nikhil from YouTube wants to know, after an H-1B transfer denial, I filed an H-4 application and now I'm looking for a new employer to uh, revive my H-1B. Will filing a new H-1B transfer application have any issues due to the previous denial? Well, generally, um, assuming that the denial has nothing related to fraud or misrepresentation on your part, um, if you're filing with a completely separate company, then that uh, petition stands on its own merit and the fact that you were denied with a different company should have no impact at all. Um, now, status might be another issue. If you don't have the H-4 status yet, meaning your H-4 hasn't been approved yet and you're trying to still do a transfer or change status back to H-1B, it's possible that your I-94 could be denied if you're not maintaining valid status at the time of refiling the transfer but the petition itself should not be impacted by a prior denial with a different company. Anji Reddy has this question from YouTube. Can I do a I-1, uh, can, I, can I do a PhD after I-140 is approved? Yes, you can. Uh, there's no technical rule that says that you can't do a PhD after your I-140 is approved. However, Mr. Anji Reddy, if you're planning to do I-140 only to get into EB-1 category, you may want to discuss with your lawyer and a private consultation before you do embark into a PhD program, a lengthy process, a strenuous process, and an expensive process for you to do it. Is it only for getting an EB1 category? I would recommend that you contact a lawyer. If you just want to do it, you know, if you are like artificial intelligence, I really want to go into that field, I want to do it, I don't see any problem in it. You should go ahead and do it. Um, Raul from YouTube works for a nonprofit employer and his employer applied for an H-1B this year in the master's cap and it got picked in the lottery. He wants to know if the H-1B is approved, was it on cap exempt or cap subject? Um, you're not going to be able to know that based on the approval notice. You have to look into the actual I-129 form that was filed. There are various boxes that would have been filled out. Um, if you are filing as a cap subject petition and whether it's in the master's cap or regular cap. So it's all based on what's submitted in the I-129 form. Money from YouTube has this question. Her I-94 expires on February of 2021. H-1B has been denied. Uh, H-1B transfer has been denied, uh, but her previous company's I-94 expires in February of 2021. Assuming that you're working with a transferred company, that means that you moved from company A, which I don't know for, uh, uh, H-1B is expiring in February of 2021 to company B, um, you can stay up to 60 days in the United States. It's a grace period that's allowed. In that 60 day period, if you have another job opportunity, you can apply for the H-1B. You can apply with the same company, one more H-1B transfer, once your H-1B is denied with the existing company. We have used that several times and we had not had any problem as of now getting the approvals if your I-94 is valid. Even if your previous company withdrew the H-1B that is valid until February of 2021, you still have the 60 day grace period to stay, to change, to, to apply with the same company or go back to the same old company and file a H-1B. You have all these options. That's the reason I was pointing out is to getting the decision before your I-94 expires. Have a lot of different options as compared to when your I-94 expires. Uh, Sumit from YouTube wants to know if you can get a B-1, B-2 visa after you already have an I-140 approved and have moved back to your home country. Um, I wouldn't say it's impossible, but the chances are low of getting that visa because the B-1, B-2... I may have a second opinion on this, Emily. Um, one thing is, Sumit, that we both agree, Emily, is that they have to pick the thing that on the DS-160, there is a column that says, have you ever applied for the I-140? You have to pick it. But you're telling the chances are low, is it right, Emily? I mean, it all depends on the situation. If yeah. he's able to, you know, if he has gone back to his home country and he's been there for 10 years and has had a job there for 10 years and has property there and all of his family is there, 
having that approved I-140 may not be that important. But if he's been in, back in his home country for two weeks and he doesn't have a job yet there and he's really just trying to come back to the U.S., mm -hmm. that's a different story. What are the other steps that you can do to, to mitigate the I-140, Emily? Well, I think that you know, in, if, if you have the intention of at some point going back home and want to have the potential of coming back on a B-1, B-2 or an F-1 or something like that, the I-140 petition, that form, gives you an option to state whether you are intending to file adjustment of status in the United States or whether you will consular process your green card. Um, so if you select the option for consular process, that gives you some kind of argument you could make that, look, on this particular trip into the U.S., I, it is temporary. I selected on my I-140 petition consular processing because I intend to go back home and process my green card through the consulate. So uh, that kind of gives you What about on the, on the issue that if the I-140 has been approved for more than 180 days, do you recommend them to withdraw that? Because anyway, he's not going to use it immediately, that I-140. You know, assuming that that job offer is no longer available, I mean, you're not going to be able to use that I-140 anyway. So yeah, I would ask the employer to withdraw it. And that helps to show as well that, yeah, at that point when the I-140 was filed, you did have immigrant intent, but plans changed, and now you don't. And that I-140 has since been withdrawn. I do think uh, Sumit also mentions that he still has a valid H-1B till 2022, and that also does impact your ability to get the B-1, B-2. Um, you have to be able to convince the um, consular officer that the purpose of your visit into the U.S. is truly for tourism or business and not to work because you've already come to work and maybe you lost that job and you're just trying to get back. You know, it's all about what is the purpose of your trip, what is your actual intention, and um, are you able to convey that to the officer well enough to be able to get the visa. Uh, one thing that I would suggest you very strongly is to make sure that in the DS-160, there's a column that says, have you ever filed an immigrant petition? Please answer yes to that question. Even if you have put the option of the consular processing, even if your I-140 has been withdrawn, I want you to pick those things. If you don't pick that one, then it will be considered that you are misrepresented, you may be barred forever coming into the United States. And if you pick that answer, yes, if they don't like you and they don't give the visa, that's okay. I mean, you can still apply one more time. You can still apply for H1, L1, and other options, which is not going to affect anything. But make sure that you pick the column that you have filed an I-140 application before. Uh, so deep from YouTube's wife's uh, EAD got approved, but then they were asked to send in new photos because they didn't meet the photo requirement, and he wants to know how long it might take to get the card in this scenario. I would plan on 60 days, if not longer. <laughs> they don't do anything fast, even when it's, when it's an EAD, even if you have a job offer waiting, even if you're going to lose your job. They just don't care. I mean, like we talked about earlier, the ombudsman, who is the person responsible for helping immigrants navigate problems she's that been paid arise. for it the position is created for it at the time of bush, admi and she's bush administration anti-immigration and wants to keep immigration at the lowest level possible and she's the one that's in charge of helping you um so yeah i would you know i would not expect a fast result on that unfortunately emily what's the prediction for eb1 category uh well, I, there, uh, there was an update from the um, State Department on that, that already, so we're only in the first month of the new fiscal year, they've already the used up... The year seven, starts from October 1st. They've already used up 17% of India's EB1 Category, okay. Category. So there's still 87% left, you mean to say? 80, yeah, 83% left, but that's with the date being... Backlog so much, retrogress so much. Okay. So I would not expect it to move any time in the near future. So okay, so it's the the previous. Uh, I don't think so. It's going to cross 2017 pretty soon. Mm -mm. No. If it moves at all, I think the earliest would be not till January. But even then, it would be very slight. Um, Arvin from YouTube wants to know if H-1B premium processing will be stalled. I'm assuming he means the suspension that has happened a couple of times before. Um, you know, 
It all depends on processing times and uh, government priorities. I don't see it happening in the near future, but absolutely that is always uh, a potential. So um, yeah, I would, there's nothing out there that requires the immigration service to allow premium processing. It's up to their discretion. Uh, Rakesh uh, from Facebook has this question. He filed H-1B, H-4 and EAD together. H-1 is approved, H-4 and EAD is not approved. Is there a possibility that uh, the H-4 and EAD has been approved and not updated? No, Rakesh, you are completely in dark. I don't know where you are at. You should be coming to our Facebook Live and YouTube Live every week to follow the immigration. USCIS is no longer approving H-4 plus EADs along with the H-1B. They stopped doing it for all, almost all the applications that they had been filed on or after March 22nd of 2019. Uh, we have not seen a single case as of now that we have been filed on or after March 22nd where the H-1B, H-4 and EAD has been bundled together. They have been approved together. Why March 22nd of 2019? Because from March 22nd of 2019, all I-539s, that means the H-4s, uh, requires a fingerprinting requirements. And that's where we are hindered at on the fingerprinting requirement. That because uh, the uh, H-4 is going through the fingerprinting, they are not adjudicating along with the H-1B approvals. Um, Manju from YouTube has an H-1B extension that was filed in California Service Center in normal processing where normal processing time is eight and a half to ten and a half months. He wants to know what are the options if the extension takes more than 180 days. Well first I want to say there is no 180 day time period for you to worry about but what you do need to worry about is if your extension has been pending and your I-94 has expired for more than 240 days, then you are no longer eligible to continue working. You can remain in the U.S. and wait for your extension to process, but if you hit 240 days from the day your I-94 expired, you're no longer eligible to work. Now, of course, all of this can be avoided by upgrading to premium processing, and you don't have to worry about any delays like that. Pallini J. Ball has this good question though. Um, she has the H-4 plus EAD approved until two years. Do we need to file the H-4 plus EAD application when transferring a H-1B to the new employer? I would do that. Uh, one thing is that we, um, we know that the H-4 EAD cannot be filed more than 180 days before it's expiring, but they have not been implementing that strictly at this point of time. So I would file for H-4 and EAD right now to get that extra one more year of H-4 plus EAD extension. You can do that right now or it's up to you. If you want to wait, you can wait for an year and then file for H-4 plus EAD at that point of time. It's up to you. Uh, I may want to club them together if I were you rather than filing it later on. Um. Dang from YouTube wants to know, um, his friend is asking about the chance of an L1A approval from the Mumbai consulate. He's on L1 and in India now. Well, uh, I would say partly it depends on if this was an individual L1 petition approved by USCIS or a blanket petition where he's applying directly to the consulate. Um, and it really depends on the situation for an L1A, whether it's manager or executive, you have to show the position needs to be at a high level within the company and have um, be supervising other managers or professional level employees. Um, so, you know, unfortunately, I can't really answer that question because it completely depends on the strength of the case and whether it is going for stamping based on a petition already approved by USCIS or a blanket approval. Smriti has this interesting question. Um, the H-1B has been approved. H-4 is pending. Can she go for the H-4 stamping though her H-4 is pending? Um, absolutely no problem with it. You can use the H-1B approval of your husband and take it and show your marriage certificate and go for the H-4 approval. You don't need a H-4 approval if you're going for stamping. H-1 approval is quite sufficient. 
Um, Sri Ram from YouTube wants to know if there's any proposal for tightening F-1 visas and work authorization by the current administration. So first of all, uh, the number of F-1 visas that are being denied at the consulates has increased. There are many, many people that are not able to get the F-1 visa, even though there's no change in the law or the regulations that is based more on the extreme vetting and the additional security clearances students are having to go through. So yes, it's harder to get the F-1 visa stamp. On the work authorization side, there currently is not a proposal to change the OPT or the STEM extension regulations. However, it is on the unified agenda uh, where ICE is planning to propose some kind of regulation regarding OPT and STEM OPT. And I believe that is um, on the fall agenda. We were supposed to see something potentially in October uh, of this year. Now, these uh, agendas often have the dates delayed, so it's not surprising that we're in October and haven't seen anything, but I do think it's still on the horizon. Suvalin has this question. My wife is, on, uh, my wife is uh, abroad and she is using a green card. Does she need any travel document to come back into the United States? If she's coming back into the United States within six months after she exited the country, um, uh, within 180 days, absolutely she doesn't need anything else other than green card to come into the United States. If she's coming between six months to one year, uh, there is some gray area in that period of time whether they can come on the green card or not based on her intention and certain other things. If it is more than one year that your wife is outside the country on a green card and she is trying to come back, she definitely needs travel permit. And th those travel permits are called uh, re-entry permits that need to be approved, that need to be applied before she travels outside the country. Uh, so within six months, not a problem. After one year, definitely a problem. If it is six months to one year, it's a discretion of the officer. You may want to check with the lawyer on that. Um, Anam from YouTube ha already had the green card interview, but the decision is still pending. He has the EAD combo card, that's the EAD plus the advanced parole, and wants to know if he goes to the home country and the green card is denied while he's outside, can he come back to the U.S. using that combo card? Um, unfortunately, no, that card will no longer be valid. You can't come in to work or use the advanced parole to travel in. Um, he wants to know if he would be able to use a B-1, B-2 visa. Uh, I think that might be a uh, difficulty given that you know you have to prove your intention is in line with the purpose of that visa as well as that you have non-immigrant intent yet you already had a pending green card. Um, so if you're anticipating a potential denial of the 485, travel might not be the best plan right now. Rakesh is telling that his H4 is approved and H-1B is approved. That definitely seems to be a mistake that, that the H-4 has been approved and the H-1 has not been approved. Uh, it definitely seems to be a mistake though because we haven't seen those where we have received the H-4 when the H-1B has not been approved. Um, Vikas from YouTube, his current I-94 expires in February and he's filed the H-1 extension. His wife has her own H-1 and wants to know if it would help to file an H-4 um, as a um, kind of back option. Um, it certainly won't hurt. I guess it would really, in my mind, depend on whether you filed the H-1 extension in premium um, or based on the timing, the processing times, are you likely to get the H-1 decision before your current I-94 expires in February 2020? Um, and also, how, what is the strength of your petition? What's the SOC code? What documents were submitted? Do you work in-house for a name, you know, a household name company, or do you work for a small consulting company? Um, so really, it depends on the potential risk for a denial. When that denial might come in would determine whether an H-4 is worth it. We have some ethical question that I need your advice on too. And this comes from Sundar's question. Uh, his H-1B, what is the H-1B extension approval ratings in Texas as compared to the other service centers? Obviously, my answer to the question is 
uh, Sundar, uh, anything is better than California Service Center. <laughs> Uh, Texas Service Center is definitely not, is much better service center now. We got it recently, so it's good. Emily, there are some people that are asking me in, in the conference call, the daily conference call that I conduct, and other places they're asking, uh, my employer is in California. I actually want to move to Texas just because of the approval rating. Is it ethical for me to tell? <laughs> Because I know the percentage of chances are higher in denial in California Service Center than any other service center. You mean the company wants to move? No, the employee wants to move out of that company. Oh, well, um, I don't know. I, I, <laughs> I don't think it's that much different to it's, where I would but uproot Emily, my But if you're an immigrant, life. life is dependent on it. Yeah, I think there are certain types of cases that have a hard time in California, but in, I don't know. Yeah, I, I, if you have doubtful, I would rather choose on getting the decision before the I-94 expires. That's the main thing that I would use because if you get the denial, then you definitely have all other options open for you. That's the main thing that I would do rather than actually skipping nice employers from California has nice employers that we know about uh, compared to you know other states. So. I'm not sure if I will be able to do it. I will try to get the decision before the I-94 expires. Um, Pavani from Facebook wants to know if it's safe to move employers after six months of the I-140 approval, and where can an I-140 holder check if the case is safe to move to a new employer? Well, the, the I-140 is just one part of the puzzle. So once the I-140 has been approved for 180 days, it is safe to move to another employer meaning that if your old employer withdraws that I-140, you can still use it to get extensions beyond the three year lim six year limit. You can still use it for your spouse to get the H-4 EAD, and you can still keep your priority date. You still have to go through the PERM and I-140 process again if it's withdrawn, um, so you have to consider that as part of whether it's safe to transfer employers. Is this new employer likely to get the labor certification and I-140 approved? Are they likely to file it for you in the, um, in the near future? And then just the H-1B process itself, what kind of company is it? What kind of job is it? Is it a strong case for an H-1B transfer? So the I-140, there's no place to check whether it's safe or not. Um, it's just if it's been approved for 180 days, you qualify to use that I-140 in the future for other purposes. Um, Ravind Nod from Facebook has this question. My H-1B extension is, uh, amendment plus extension is in progress. I-94 has expired. Can I change my job right now? I would advise against you, Ravind Nod. Here is the reason, though. If you change the job to some other company, uh, since your I-94 expired, uh, your change of company, that the change of employer, will only be approved with the I-94 if your extension amendment, extension slash amendment is approved. Um, so if you move to from company A to company B, there's a good chance that company A will withdraw the H-1B and then company B's H-1B will not be approved with the I-94. That is considered as a bridge. Uh, so the bridge is broken and even the, once the bridge is broken, uh, the, uh, the, the, the bridge is the, uh, time gap between your second company filing and your I-94 expired. Since the bridge is broken, you can't get a H-1B approval. I would advise you not to move at this point of time. Uh, let's see. Some uh, processing times with regards to the H-4 plus EAD. We have seen anywhere between four months to about nine months uh, on the H-4 plus EAD at this point of time. Uh, so uh, there is another process if you want to. You can join our litigation process that we do file every two weeks. You can join it. Once you file the litigation, we're getting the approvals in 60 days. You may want to check on that. We group up together 40 or 60 people every other week and take them to the court and go get those things approval. Uh, that's a better way rather than waiting because a lot of people will lose their jobs if the EAD is not approved in the proper timing. Um, Aman from Facebook recently had the H-1B approved that started on October 1st. Um, he also had a STEM OPT that was valid until January 2021. The SEVIS record is deactivated or complete because the H-1B is approved. Uh, Aman wants to know if he plans to change jobs, is it possible to reactivate that STEM OPT to change jobs? Unfortunately, no. 
Now that you've moved on to H1, your STEM OPT is long gone. The only way to change jobs uh, would be to file an H1B transfer with the new employer. Priyanka has this question. Just curious, why not California Service Center? Well, when we look into the stats on the amount of approvals and amount of denials, amount of RFEs, even though we don't see that much difference with regards to the statements what the USCIS says that they're uniform in those things, but when we check our own applications and when we speak with people like you, I mean, it's not that we just give you information in this Facebook, YouTube, in the daily conference call and blog. We also get information from you and we use that information, what you're giving, to decimate to the other people and educate ourselves too. California Service Center is the worst service center out of all the four, four service center. I bet all the immigration lawyers will agree on that. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Venusha from YouTube wants to know what happens if her H-4 expires while a change of status from H-4 to F-1 is in progress. This is really important. Common question. Um, the requirement is to be approved for a change of status to F1. You must maintain your current status up to within 30 days of the program start date on your I-20. So if your H4 status is expiring and your program start date is more than 30 days after that, your change of status will be denied. Now, what is also important is the processing time of the I-539, because it's so long, it causes that program start date to change every semester. So you may have filed your change of status from H-4 to F-1 with a requested program start date of January 2020, the spring semester, but your F-1 application is still going to be pending in January the school is automatically going to roll back your start date to the summer semester or possibly even the fall of 2020. So if you are not maintaining your H-4 status all the way through the fall of 2020, your change of status will be denied. A lot of people are not aware of this. So you either need to extend your H-4 and make sure that it's all the way extended till the new program start date as long as that I-539 remains pending or if you are not eligible for continued H-4 extensions, for example, if you're turning 21 and you're a child under your parents' H-1, you may actually have to file what's called a B-2 bridge. It's an application to change status from H-4 to B-2 in order to bridge you to the new F-1 start date. So it's very complicated. It has a lot of moving parts to it. Um, but be aware that if your H-4 status expires while that change of status is pending, it's not like other types of visas where you're in a period of authorized stay and you will still get the change of status. Here, you have to maintain your status all the way up to within 30 days of the program start date. Emily, on the Senate 386 spells, and I see some messages which are not so good in, um, in the YouTube here. Um, one statement, especially from Joss, is that why are the Democrats doing that? And uh, jo uh, why are the Democrats helping the illegal people? Uh, Josh, if you want to get any benefits to what you want to, don't go to the uh, to senators or congressmen and tell them why are you doing that? Why are you doing that? Just try to tell them what you want, why you need it, why you're affected. That's a better way of dealing with the politicians. So you're going to tell them you're doing all wrong. You're not going to get any benefit. Uh, that's my sincere advice, I mean, especially on the Senate 386 bill, if you are going to approach them, don't approach the congressman saying, why are you giving to that person? Just tell them, look, we are discriminated here. We want to be treated equally. Uh, the Senate 386 bill is not giving any importance to Indians or Chinese. It's a misconception a lot of people are, 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 are telling. It's just treating everybody equally. Uh, so please, when you approach to the congressman, don't tell that, oh, give benefit to Indians or Chinese. No, every software professional should be treated equally. Every uh, employ, uh, employ, employee with a certain qualification should be treated only a certain way and you should not look into the country of birth. That's the argument you should make. Don't try to go into any other arguments. Why are you lazy? Why are you doing that? Why, don't ask all those things, that's not your job. Just tell them, please pass Senate 386 bill. This is going to make everybody in equal range. I strongly recommend that you argue in that way. Um, Canon from Facebook has a good question. His company is in Houston, um, 
but his H-1B case got sent to the California Service Center and wants to know why. Well, when was it Texas filed? doesn't file in Texas. So all companies in Texas have to file in but California. But except in, starting from September onwards, we got the jurisdiction for Texas in Texas. So if the application was filed before September, it could have gone to the California Service Center. If it was filed on or after September, if I'm not sure, August last week or September first week, somewhere around that time, Texas jurisdiction was being given to Texas. Before that time, it was all the Texas was going to California Service Center. The Georgia and Florida were coming to Texas. But now, from September onwards, it, Texas has been given to Texas. Um, Sarish from Facebook has an approved I-140 with an old employer and moved to the new employer and has started the PERM process. He wants to know if the process this time around will be any easier since he's already gotten an approval or if it's going to be any faster. Uh, no. you. Every petition, every PERM stands on its own. The fact that you got approved once before with a different employer has no impact positively or negatively on uh, the new employer's filing. So you have to go through the whole thing again. They're going to look at everything again. It's a completely different case process. Alan has this question from YouTube. He has a B-1 visa. He traveled for a temporary work meeting and is back in his home country. And now he wants to travel to the United States on the B-1 for a vacation, not for the company. Can he do that? Absolutely, no problem. You can do that. It will not cause any problem. Please have the documentation that you're coming here for vacation. Let's say, for example, you're going to Las Vegas or you're going to Disney. You know, you have the tick, you have the at least hotel bookings and all those things. You'll be fine. Absolutely no problem with it. All right. I think that's about it for today. Well, thank you guys for coming in. Uh, please don't forget to subscribe to our immigration news at rnlawgroup.com. And Emily's blog is at immigrationgirl.com. If you want to make an appointment with me or any of, any of our colleagues, uh, I saw some messages. If you want to contact us, you want to make an appointment, Emily is mine and all of our, uh, you know, the 18 other lawyers that are in our office, their appointments are available for you, for you guys. You can always book based on your timings that you want, the lawyer that you want. It's there available at rnlawgroup.com. Thanks for joining. Thank you, guys.